end so that we can unload this uh, recorded seminar to uh, our you know, website you know, later. And uh, let me briefly introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Jae-hoon Jung, and he's an assistant professor of geomatics in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering at Oregon State University. And prior to joining OSU, he worked in the Department of Photogrammetry at the University of Bonn to study robotics, machine learning, and he received his master's and a PhD degree in the civil engineering, civil environmental engineering from Yonsei University from South Korea. And he has over 10 years of experience developing algorithm tools for transportation infrastructure management using LiDAR point cloud data. And he also, and I just had a conversation with him briefly, uh, um, also, you know, co-founder and the CTO of, you know, tech transfer company called the Easy Data MD. Uh, with uh, some collaboration with uh, faculty members in the you know the geomatics department at Oregon State University, and his current research focus on transport transportation asset management, scan to beam, deep learning, and uh, also uh, his recent project includes uh, extraction and the classification of pavement marking program, and uh, you know a lot of other you know project that was mentioned in the. Uh, you know, advertisement that was sent out. And I'm really excited to have, you know, Dr. Zhang to come give us a seminar because a lot of project that he's going to talk about today is also interest uh, in our, you know, geomatics, you know, uh, department here at Purdue as well. So with that, uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, stage is yours. Uh, please take it away. Yeah, thanks for your great introduction. So yeah, my name is Jae Won Jung. I'm a research assistant professor of geomatics at Oregon State University. So this presentation is about the scan to beam. So actually, um, it's a project about uh, turning the point cloud data into digital twin from for the uh, existing building. So let me first introduce our research team. So actually, we worked together through uh, 2021, 20 and 21 for the last couple of years. So as you can see here, our research team has a really diverse backgrounds. So for example, Michael Orson, Ezra Che, and myself, we have geomatics background. And then the Yerda Turkin and Yong, um, they have the construction engineering background. And also we have Pusin Lee from Oregon State University. Actually, he's an AI machine learning expert from computer science. And also we have people from industry, for example, Aaron Morris and Ryan. They have been kind of working on developing some, you know, cloud-based web platform to uh, process the point cloud data. And also we have Jin Wo. Uh, he's, uh, you may know the, the world famous writer website, the writernews.com. So he's the founder of the, that website. And also we have student researchers. Um, so yeah. So this project was funded by National Science Foundation through 20 and 21. And then also we recently submitted a new proposal to continue our research on this can to approach. So just a bit of background of this research. So, you know, the um, growing population in cities is leading to a need for more and larger buildings. And the global construction industry is expected to reach about the tri 11 trillion dollars by 2024. Uh, of course, the COVID outbreak has uh, severely impacted the construction business across the world. But you know, some so some number here uh, may not be true. But still, buildings are a major part of our modern society. I think we already we all uh, uh, agree with this. So as buildings are increasing in complexity, there have been a lot of issues, for example, uh, the energy consumption, pollution, safety, and there have been also a lot of efforts to address those issues, such as the green building certification and smart buildings. And another way to address these issues is kind of using the building information model or building information modeling. So building information model, it's kind of representation of facility that records all the information relevant to buildings right to cycle from construction to demolitions. The beam has that um, particularly um, created after the construction stage is called as built beam. So as built beam has a number of potential benefits, for example, um, detection of defects, timely quality control, and support for you know, important decision makings, 
and operation and maintenance of existing buildings. So typically to create as built beam, so we take point cloud data and then as input and then trace each boundary as you can see in this figure. But um, actually there are several challenges, for example, the huge data size and then knowledge in the data set. And also the registration is always painful and then classification of object and attribution is always challenging. Even though the, despite the, all the advances in the scanning technologies. So this is what we are trying to solve. Our research team is focusing on. So taking the scan data and then create this kind of this digital representation of it with minimal user interactions. So um, we are working on this uh, web, uh, web platform, web cloud, uh, based web platform Insta Twin. This is a quarter to platform and data repository that allows you to use machine learning and other um, techniques, state of the art techniques to for the purpose of the um, creating as built beam from scan data for the AEC industry and other um, building and the construction societies. So here we have put together a short video clip to show you kind of the um, conceptual prototype you are trying to put into an interface. So this is the prototype. So the final product will be uh, um, different, would be different. But anyway, I think it gives you a brief idea how the our web based uh, cloud based web platform would work. So first of all, you need to create your own account. And then you need to enter the um, some kind of your project information, uh, the building types and the data types such like that. And once you have your point of cloud data onloaded to the cloud server, then it will display um, the point of cloud data in the left-hand side. In the middle, you will see some kind of pre-processing step, for example, segmentation and classification. And then finally, you will see some output models on the right-hand side. And also this platform will allow you to kind of make some edits to the uh, pre-processing result to improve the uh, final output models. So for example, here you merge these two different um, segmentation into one that represent the same world. And then after that, uh, you will have this kind of the 2D flow plan, also the um, 3D um, as well the model of the existing buildings. And then finally, the platform will allow you to export some your app in a different file format, for example, CAD file, shape file, or mesh. Also, we plan to um, add the IFC file format, which is the industry standard that has been widely used for BIM communities. So, and then let me talk about so what's going on in the behind the scene and some challenges we are currently trying um, trying to tackle. So one challenging problem is the scan data collections. For example, here is an example of the scan data collected in a very large scale indoor environment. And as you can see, it includes a lot of rooms and corridors and objects. So you may, it should simply put, it will be really challenging to collect this data and then registering it and also turn this data into 3D model. So First of all, let me talk about the data collection issues. So, so traditional scanning system can be challenging because the after you collecting those data sets, you need to um, register all of the scan data into common coordinate systems. So there are some algorithms and commercial software that make it easier to register those data sets, but basically still, it's just still challenging and requires some manual interactions. Also, it kind of did some kind of setup in your site. For example, you need to install the tripod and target to register the scans obtained from different locations. So my early work um, during my PhD, I was kind of focused on slam techniques to kind of you know, apply to the mobile scanning system. So SLAM is short for simultaneous localization and mapping technique. So basically, basic idea is that the SLAM technique has been developed and used for the uh, autonomous robot and self-driving cars. So the problem is that here, 
to get the map of surrounding environment, you first need to localize your robot positions. You need to find your robot position. So in that way, you can put the map information, put map information with respect to the robot location and or positions. On the other hand, to get the robot position, you need a map, right? In that way, you can put your robot location on the map. So it's kind of, you know, chicken or egg problem. You need a map to localize the robot. And at the same time, you also need a robot position to get the map of surrounding environments. So what you can do is that you can put them all together and into the same matrix and vector as an unknown, the map feature information and then robot location. Those are our unknowns and then put them all together into a single matrix and they serve it simultaneously. So this is the reason why we call it simultaneous localization mapping techniques. So recent, a lot of the robot scanning system, the recent state of the robot scanning system kind of using and adopting these SLAM techniques to get the continuous scan data. So there are several advantages of SLAM techniques. For example, on-site setup is really simple. You don't need, need tripod or target for the registration because the registration is fully automated for the most of the SLAM-based mobile scanning system. And another advantage is that it doesn't require GPS information. Of course, some other um, mobile scanning system, I mean, the vehicle-based outdoor mobile scanning system use the GPS information, but for indoor scanning, um, you know, the GPS signal is not available. So the same technique instead can use the scan data, also the image data for the registration of those scan data. So without the GPS information, so um, it can be more personal and then collect the continuous scan data uh, with a minimal setup. Right. But the one issue is that I'm going to talk about is the SLAM mostly the power scanning system is not as accurate as the uh, other kind of traditional um, scanning system. And another problem would be um, the data error um, accumulations. So um, yeah, this is a, one example of the Samsung more robot cleaner that used the SLAM technique to navigate each way move around, move forward. So this is my board scanning system that I, uh, I developed this system during my PhD. So during my PhD, the board scan system was not as common as it is right now. So anyway, so I uh, used the three razor range finder. I mean, the roll cost scanning to the scanners, one is mounted horizontally to, and used to for the navigation of the robot. And the other scanners are mounted vertically and scan the vertical profile of surrounding environment like this. In the middle, you see the trajectory data. So basic idea here is that you can sequentially register the vertical profile of point cloud data along the uh, robot trajectory. Uh, another way of the um, over scanning system is the stabbing scanning strategy. So in that case, you can just move to your scanner scanning system and collect the data and move to another spot and collecting data. And then finally, you will have several different scan data uh, from the uh, different location and then put them all together into a common coordinate system using, for example, ICP algorithm, cloud to cloud, cloud um, matching algorithms. But scan data collection using SLAM is, can be challenging. Why is that so? Because the errors in the measurement, for example. So we already know that there is no perfect sensors out there. There is no perfect sensor. All sensors have some errors. So these errors, for example, can be propagated to the robot positions. And then this robot position may have some errors. This error will be again propagated to the next measurement. And this measurement error also can be propagated back to the robot position and then accumulate again, again and again. And finally, the accuracy, the mapping quality will diverge. So to address this problem, what you can do is that you can create, uh, make a kind of loop closure. So this is an example. I collected this data in a long corridor, looks like a circle shape. And then this is the starting point. And then I collected the data around the corridor and back to the starting position. And as you can see here is the misalignment between the starting point and the, and the end point. And then in the right hand side, you see this is the error ellipsis, 2D error ellipsis, showing that 
Uh, in the beginning, the errors are pretty small, but it gets larger and larger. And finally, in the end, it's kind of tend to diverge in the end. So what you can do is that after making a ripple closure, we can do some kind of adjustment. We usually use the risk to scale adjustment to uh, solve this uh, misalignment. In order to, to do that, we need to identify the same locations. In that way, we can link our starting point and then ending point and point and then do kind of risk to scale adjustment to minimize the misalignment and errors. So this is the resulting error ellipse. And as you can see, the error ellipse has reduced a lot in the end after making this adjustment. So this kind of the post-processing adjustment is uh, kind of the very important in SLAM technique. So I believe most commercial software out there and systems adopt SLAM technique as well as this kind of the uh, post-processing error uh, adjustment to improve the mapping quality. Another interesting um, overscanning system is the, um, the iPhone sensor, iPhone RIDAR sensor. So recently, uh, it's already been a, a couple of years, but anyway, the Apple, they added this RIDAR sensor to their iPhone Pro and iPhone Pack. And then you can collect some kind of the point cloud data, create point your own point cloud data using the phone. This is a very kind of interesting idea and also very low cost um, scanning system. So um, I also, uh, I'm also the CTO of the Easy Data Company, this tech transfer company, and we are kind of working on this project from the Federal Highway. Um, they are kind of hoping to use the, this kind of mobile phone rider data for the, to create a digital twin of highway constructions. So we are now evaluating uh, many different apps and data quality as well to see if it's if it's feasible to use this mobile phone rider data for the other uh, construction applications. So here we have a couple of examples here. So in the left-hand side, you can see that the, um, the scanning data collected in a small room in the environment. And on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the kind of, we collected this data along the street. So we kind of walk through the, this street, uh, maybe I remember two minutes and then go back to the starting point. So the small room looks okay. And, but as you can see, when we go back to the starting point, you can see this kind of the misalignment of the same object here. So yeah, definitely this mobile phone rider is not comparable to other commercial scanning system, particularly in terms of the accuracy, but still, you know, this is very low cost sensor. So uh, also provide you the RGB value and other information. And also you can export the result, output result in a variety of different file formats. So yeah, we are still working on it. And I think, yeah, but anyway, it's worth investigating further and then see how to improve the result on uh, data quality and for the um, different application of the highway construction site. And so yeah, let me go back to the, our scan to beam approach. So after collecting those data set, the next step would be the kind of pre-processing step before modeling, uh, generating some kind of beam models. So we are kind of investigating very different types, many uh, uh, various machine learning techniques to facilitate the uh, scan to beam process. And this machine learning technique can be used for, for example, the object classification, and in reconstruction, if the, your scan data has some scan holes and then occlusions. And then also machine learning can, can be used for the material classification and also damage detection. Um, damage detection is particularly used for after the earthquake or the kind of the disaster. And then your um, buildings may have some cracks and then uh, damages and you can detect those damages using the scan data by in combination with the machine learning techniques. And then, uh, actually, in this presentation, I like to more focus on the uh, parametric and model parametric modeling of the scan data based on the machine learning techniques. So this is the machine learning based on scan to beam workflow. So the um, the point cloud data, low point cloud data, some has some important feature information such as the x y z value and intensity and color information. And in addition to that, we can 
extract more higher level information such as the, uh, the surface normal and coverture. And those information can be used for the next step pre-processing of the point cloud data. I mean, this is the step of the segmentation and classification of those data set. So segmentation here means that uh, the identifying the same, the points on the same surface. So you can group the points on the same surface and give the same um, color uh, here as an example. And then also you can identify some different object, kind of give some labels to a different object in the scene. After that, those segmentation and classification results will be fed into the machine learning to another, another stages for, to create this kind of the, you know, the uh, building information model. So this machine learning technique is particularly useful for the uh, non-parameter modeling. I'll talk about this in a bit, but before that, I'd like to uh, introduce this segmentation technique. So no more validation analysis approach. So one of my colleague, Ezra Che, uh, he's working on this segmentation approach. So as you can see, a lot of different objects here, kind of they are grouped into the kind of the um, colored with different um, variables. So the, the, what you can do is the segmented result. So for example, if you want to extract only the flow here, then if you click one of point here, then it will return the entire point that consisting of this flow. So it can be very useful for a variety of different modeling approaches. It group the point on the same surface in that way. You, it makes it easier, much easier to uh, use those point cloud data set and the, for the further applications. So this segmentation techniques can, not only can be used for indoor environment, but also can be applied for the uh, outdoor environment as well. So this is the segmentation of result of the um, outdoor buildings. Uh, actually, these buildings are at OSU. Um, and also this segmentation technique can be used for the segmentation of airborne rider data as well. So if you're interested in this segmentation technique, then just let me know. Then I'll uh, let you know the contact information of Ezra Che, Dr. Ezra Che. And also uh, our research member, the Fushin Lee, uh, he's working on this deep learning based on neural network architecture to uh, classify the point cloud data set in the scene. So this is the some result here. This is the point cloud data input. And this is the, in the middle, this is the ground truth data. In the right-hand side, you can see the same classification result of the uh, point comp, the data classification deep learning architecture result. So uh, I remember that they compared this result with the other state with the other, uh, other method, art method, and then they achieved the kind of the uh, best accuracy in terms of the classification result. And then this kind of segmentation and classification result can be used for the uh, non-parametric modeling. So non-parametric modeling here means that so some object in the scene is cannot be very challenging to parameterize. There has very complex shape and it looks very complicated. So what it can do is that we can apply some segmentation as you can see here in this example, and then apply the machine learning technique to classify and identify different object in the scene, and then give some labels. And then once you have this label information, then you can just put some existing models from the library. So in that way, for example, columns and flow, in that way, you can still fit those existing model um, into the complex um, point cloud object here. So this is kind of the non-parameter modeling approach. Um, but uh, my research is kind of more focused on parametric modeling. So I was kind of wanted to parameterize those models with some numbers. I mean, in that way, it's more, a bit more easier to modify and make some edits to the model. So this is one of my earliest work. So during my PhD, so I firstly, I kind of, uh, this is, I take this, uh, the point cloud data as input and then turn this point cloud data into this geometric drawing. Um, at this stage, it's not a model. This is a geometric drawing. What I mean is that I first 
perform the ransack segmentation to the point cloud data and then traced each segment and then put trace the boundaries and then put them all together into this kind of geometric drawing. So instead of using the point cloud data in BIM software, I use this geometric drawing and then to create this kind of aspect model. In that way, I was able to reduce the data size because the point cloud data size, point cloud data usually have very um, huge data size. So sometimes it kind of read to system down or system value in your BIM software. Instead of using the point cloud data, I used geometric drawing. So it significantly reduced the data size while at the same time, it still preserves some important details to create this kind of asset models. But however, with the model process was kind of the still, was still manual. So it's not fully automated. So my next, next um, study was kind of focused on semi-automated modeling. So here I also take the um, point cloud data as input and then I first extracted the ceiling and flow point. Um, there are many ways you can extract the ceiling and point, uh, flow point here. And one method that I used here is that I kind of organized the point cloud G value into a histogram and then just pick the largest beam in the histogram or uh, close to the top and the bottom. So in that way, you can extract the ceiling and flow point. And then actually the ceiling boundary can represent the world surface boundary because it's less sensitive to the occlusions and other, um, the scanner and other object. Uh, so once you have this ceiling and flow point, you can trace out this boundary, but still, as you can see, um, the scan data can be noisy and the boundary of the world surface lines can be, uh, looks, all, looks um, kind of not a straight lines. So, uh, for the regularization, I first applied the segmentation and then used the risk to scale adjustment to produce this kind of uh, straight world surface lines. And then once you have these world surface lines by incorporate, incorporating the height information, they can be obtained uh, in the second step here. And then we can uh, reconstruct the 3D scene, the, I mean the 3D wireframe model that represents the world surface lines of the scan data. However, um, this, this is kind of semi-automated approaches. So the world surface line was obtained automatically, but unfortunately the openings here, uh, some windows and door openings were, were not modeled automatically. So my next approach is more focused uh, was, I kind of, you know, um, well, I tried to make it fully automated. So this is the point cloud data of the single room and corridor and it includes a lot, of, a lot of openings that represent the windows and doors. And then I kind of try to trace them all out and then kind of create this kind of the complete 3D model of a single room in the environment. So this approach was fully automated, but unfortunately uh, it was limited to single room modeling. So, but actually for the most, most um, you know, in the environment, you have multiple rooms and corridors and also some noisy points as well, right? So my next approach was focused on modeling this kind of more larger, larger scale in the environment, including multiple rooms and corridors and noisy as well. So to make the modeling uh, simpler, uh, before turned this point cloud into model, I applied this uh, room segmentation technique first. So for the room segmentation, I first rasterized the point cloud data into the 2D uh, image. And then I applied the morphological processing to close the openings to the other rooms. For example, if you want to isolate this room, actually each room is, are they're connected to the other corridor and other rooms through these openings, right? So once you close these openings, then you can separate each room from the other rooms. In that way, using this morphological processing, I was able to create this kind of the 2D um, room segmentation result. And this is the ground truth data. And this is my approach. And I compared my approach with this state of the art techniques in 2017. It's already been five years, so I don't I don't know right now what's the best approach is uh, in 20, 
2022 right now. But anyway, uh, back then I achieved the best accuracy in terms of the um the the you know the segmentation here uh, in terms of the precision and recall rate. And then another um, advantage of using my approach is that it produced a straight boundary, segmentation boundary compared to the other um, techniques. So yeah. So once you have the room segmentation result for each room, I traced out each boundary. They are kind of the labeled with different colors here. And then also apply the adjustment to produce the straight or surface line. And then once you have this word straight or surface line, then you can calculate the orthogonal distance between two parallel word surface lines. In that way, you can estimate the word thickness. Uh, but you can you may not have the scan data from the outdoor um, outside. In that case, you can just simply uh, put the kind of the um, arbitrary value, for example, 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters, depending on your applications. So this is kind of the fully automated volumetric 3D modeling of indoor environments. So it has multiple rooms as well as the world thickness and also including a lot of openings and uh, doors and windows. So, and in this, the NSF project, I improved my algorithm to process the large scale indoor environment data. So I first apply the segmentation and then extract the world surface lines, remove some noise. And then this is the uh, process of the extracting and refining the work surface line and by incorporating the um, height information and the openings, uh, you I can I was able to create reconstruct this kind of the complex 3D model uh, of the indoor environment using the scanning data. So yeah, there there are still some challenges we need to address in the future work. So for example, um yeah, so the previous work is kind of focused on creating the uh, models of the rectilinear kind of the indoor environment. That means all the objects can be modeled using the straight lines, but definitely some modern buildings have more complex shapes, particularly covered or something like that. Um, this is not a modern building. Actually, this is the cathedral, small church in the Germany when I was in Germany for a year. Um, I collect this data, and as you can see, it has a lot of the um, curved walls and curved windows and something like that. So it's kind of challenging to model this kind of the complex shape. So unfortunately, this is still, uh, you know, under development and, and not fully automated. You need to adjust a lot of parameters to get the final model outputs. But anyway, um, this is a kind of important topic we need to uh, take into consideration for future work. So once you have those as built models, that as built model of buildings can be used for maintenance and operation of buildings, but there are some other applications you can use the beam result. One of which is the NSR solar energy modeling. So yeah, this approach, you can take the 3D point cloud data, either point cloud data or the 3D mesh or uh, the beam output CAD model. And then we can kind of estimate the solar energy over time uh, based on this model. Also, it kind of has this functionality to calculate the estimate the shadow uh, information. This is very important because the, uh, the, the location exposed to the shadow can be, will have the less solar energy. Uh, so this is kind of important to step. So I have some videos here. So it shows kind of the solar energy um, variation over time uh, in the, from the morning to the evening. So definitely um, this uh, rooftop is facing to the south. That means it receives more solar energy on, compared to the other surfaces here. And this is kind of just for fun. I just got the Eiffel Tower uh, mesh data and then give some kind of arbitrary uh, location and then the, um, to estimate the solar energy. Actually, it takes a uh, very simple input, the location, longitude, uh, longitude and latitude information, as well as the, uh, what, what else? Yeah, also the orientation is really important to find out where 
which surface uh, facing to the south. So no matter how the complex the borders are, we can still estimate the solar energy. Yeah. Another application is a bit less relevant to beam uh, models, but anyway, we are also working on this project road marking extraction and classifications. So you have been closely working with Oregon Department of Transportation. So they are kind of want to have this kind of the road marking extraction tool to, to for the maintenance of road markings. For example, once you actually they collect this overrider data for the entire highway network of Oregon on a regular basis every two years. They update this database every two years. And then using this overrider data, they kind of want to extract this kind of road markings using the overrider intensity values. And this information that only have the um, geometric information, but so you can use the intensity to evaluate the road markings because there is a high correlations between the road marking retro reflectivity and the override intensity values. So once you have these road markings, it also has the this evaluation information the, to see these road markings are worn out and need to be repainted. And another project regarding this road marking inspection tool is that after extracting these markings, we can also classify these markings. For example, we are working on using the team running uh, to classify these uh, different types of road markings here. And then once you have these uh, different types of road markings, you can use this formation for the product classification or the other types of objects, for example, road up, roadway object, such as the medians and the bike lanes and crosswalks, something like that, and also curved in, uh, structures. So this is an ongoing project. We are kind of trying to classify many different roadway objects. And in addition to that, we are also focusing on classifying different types of urban objects here, typical objects, for example, ports, cars, and power lines. Um, actually, this is a combination of the machine learning approach and the conventional parametric approach. But anyway, once you have this kind of the uh, segmentation and classification result, you can use this formation to kind of the, create this kind of 3D city modeling. So just beyond the single um, beam, um, the beam creation of the single building or single small um, building environment, I kind of envision uh, extending our my approach to the kind of uh, large scale city modeling. So that can be used for uh, the uh, management of uh, the city scale um, infrastructure and also the kind of help the uh, important decision making and city planning. All right, so that's all for my presentation. And before um, uh, answering your questions, I have one announcement. So in the last year, um, as part of our NSF project, we held this, uh, the CVPR workshop. So it's a kind of the, this workshop that we are working together from the uh, computer science people and also the civil, uh, engineering people, we work together and help this workshop. For this is the scan to beam challenge. So we are going to provide the scan data for training and testing your algorithm, and then you you can submit your resulting output the uh, model for to, for the competitions. So last year we had uh, several different participants across the world, and this year workshop will be held. Uh, for the, uh, the June 19th, which is about the three months later. And then, so also we have already invited so, um, the keynote speakers from diverse backgrounds. They have been working and intensively working on the um, beam and the civil and also computer science tech, uh, community uh, about the uh, scan to beam um, application. So yeah, I'm hoping if you're interested in, please, um, the join our workshop and then see what's going on, what's the state of the technology of the scan to beam um, and some kind of, I guess, some information and also do some kind of discussions. All right, so thanks for listening. Thanks for your attention. So I put 
my email address here. If you need more information, also please contact me, reach out to me anytime. Also, I put this email address here. Yelda Token actually, she was the lead of this NSF project. And also, yeah, we are still working together. So if you need more information, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thanks for your attention. And I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. And now it's time for any question you might have from the audience. Please unmute your microphone and uh, you can ask questions directly. Josh, uh, go ahead. Th th thank you, Dr. Zhang, for this presentation. Um, yeah, I'm a yeah. PhD student working on working under Dr. Jin Ha Zhang. Um, and my question was, I, it looks like most of the data that you were using is uh, like terrestrial laser scanning data. And I was wondering uh, if you've used like photogrammetrically derived point clouds to do some of this work at all. And if so, what were some of the unique um, problems that come with using photogrammetry? Yeah, that's a good point. Definitely, yeah. For the retro SFNM, they are having a lot of advances in those kind of technologies. So you can collect very large, dense amount of point cloud data as well. So basically, I think there is no big difference of using the terrestrial laser data and the photometric data. The, so yeah, definitely, I think you can apply this kind of scanned beam approach to the photometric data as well. But to, the, to make sure uh, to get the dense enough data, do you need take uh, a lot of photos of the scene. So yeah, a big advantage of using the photometric data is that I think you don't need to purchase very expensive terrestrial LiDAR system, right? The, the, yeah. the photometric data is more cheaper and easy to use, but the, at the same time, it's sensitive to the riding conditions. So you need to be careful about collecting your data under the very good riding conditions. Other than that, I think, they're, they're pretty much the same in terms of the just collected point cloud data. Yeah. I see, thank you. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Any further questions? And Dr. you mentioned that uh, lane marking uh, is not relevant to the beam, but uh, we have uh, actually ongoing project here, Purdue, who is you know, working on the exact same problem as well. So it was very interesting yeah, to see that uh, you are working on similar problems as well. Yeah, sounds great. Mm -hmm. So actually, the, this room, we call it ROM. This is the roadmap equation tool. And actually, the Oregon Department of Transportation, they are uh, working this tool for their applications. So uh, we published this, the earlier version, version 1.2, 1.3 to public. So you can just go visit our mobilerider.com and download this tool and test it, but it's a bit outdated. It's kind of limited to extracting only the rain markings, the earlier version, but the, our recent version, the rated version, including this capability to extracting more complex road markings, including the, um, the text and other errors, something like that. And, on top of that, we are kind of in addition to that, we are planning to add the classification capability. So we are now currently testing the deep learning unit architecture and other some kind of method. But um, yeah, uh, so this is an ongoing um, approach. So there is still a room to improve, but yeah, I'm kind of, yeah, so, maybe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I'm assuming that for the you know point cloud data that you're using for this uh, rain marking extraction data is that is being collected from mobile mapping system. Yes, yeah, okay. that's correct. So you kind of you using... have your own kind of system that you guys built, or is it some, uh, you know commercial? No, there? no, no. So we are using the data collected by the Oregon Department of Transportation okay. Pegasus system. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Shen, I think your mic is on. I guess you have some question. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think it's very impressive. Um, good to see there's a big project uh, running in the West Coast of uh, OSU. <laughs> and yeah. I have a couple of questions. The first one, I think, um, 
uh, you were talking about the segmentation of the walls uh, of a building, either inside or outside. I think for the indoor environment, um, when we put it into a realistic situation, there are many furniture uh, pieces inside the indoor environment. So you, do you assume that you don't handle furniture or you assume that um, uh, you are able to segment the furniture there are, you know, or you don't model the furniture at all? Uh, so that's my first question. The second question, I think you are talking about uh, the parameter. So sorry, I forgot to open the uh, start. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about the parameter and non-parameter um, yeah. representation of, of abstract or the models. So mm -hmm. do you see a clear boundary between these two categories? And if there is one, and how you define, uh, you know, parameter and non-parameter. And also a related question, I saw many, many models that you presented. How do you actually represent this model and in the computer system so that the topological um, information, the geometrical information, uh, can be studied and can be queried and also that you can use to, you know, to calculate the, um, let's say the radiation, the energy consumption, all those things. Uh, I'm just curious, the final representation of one or both type of the models. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, those are all great questions. So thanks for asking this. So to answer your first question, the furniture. So um, in this parameter modeling, uh, actually I didn't consider the classification modeling of those furniture. I just ignore it by rasterizing the point cloud data onto 2D plane. So for example, back to the slide number 23 here, I first extracted the ceiling and floor point. That means I extract the wall surface line using the ceiling and floor point only. It doesn't include any furniture in it. Actually, I'm only considering the uh, in this approach the structural component, which are walls, windows, and columns, and then some openings and floors and yeah, the ceilings. So once you have this ceiling and floor point, you can trace out each boundary, and then by incorporating the height information, you can reconstruct the 3D wall surface lines. So again, I didn't take into consideration the furniture modeling or classification in this example. So that can be a little bit challenging because the furniture, uh, you know, this, those are really hard to model. So that's the reason why we need to consider this kind of non-parametric modeling. So rather than, for example, the if you want to model the chair, for example, it has a lot of curved shape and different parameter. May the furniture company they may have some kind of the yeah drawing or kind of the three D CAD model for their furniture, but um, the driving those parametric data from the furniture itself from the point cloud can be really challenging. So rather than applying the parametric approach, you can just put some existing model from the library to fit the chair into the point cloud data. Yeah, hope that makes sense. So, so that's the reason why we divide this two different approach, non-parameter modeling to model more complex, complicated object in the scene, including furniture, and then parameter modeling, which is more focused on structural component modeling. So yeah, hope that answer your first questions and also some uh, the second questions. And then the final app model, uh, currently this the kind of the 3D uh, app model can be exported in a CAD file format, DXF file format. So I know, so this is the scan to beam approach, but still it's challenging to turn directly the point cloud data into the IFC file format. Actually the CAD file format is kind of has a limitation of kind of the adding some kind of semantic uh, informations and topological information as well. 
So it's mostly representing just a simple geometry information and some basic labels. So in addition, in, in order to improve the final output, we need to turn this information into the, you know, the IFC file format, industry standard standard file format. It will have a lot of information, not only the geometric one, but also the a lot of semantics. Uh, those are relevant to the beam approaches. So this is kind of our future work. So yeah, we are going to develop some more um, functionality to uh, turn the data into the beam alpha file format. So, so I, as a kind of a follow up, um, mm -hmm. it seems the CTGML is kind of a popular, at least for at the larger scale for the uh, 3D CT modeling. Yes, right. Yeah, right. Are you, yeah, are you suggesting if we are working with a beam and that will that we, we should use totally different models? Oh, say again, what was your question? So, no, I mean, in the city, GML yeah. has been very popular for at the city level yeah, right. uh, okay. for individual buildings, and they have both topology and semantic. So if working at the building level for a BIM model, for BIM model, are we suggesting we should use a totally different model, or we still can um, take advantage of the uh, CTGML, CTGML, GML? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually haven't dug into the topic, the CTGML, that much, but I think definitely there is a link between those kind of different model types of types between the beam model and also CTGML. So definitely this kind of the uh, important topic was considering in our future work. So yeah, this is this research is still in our early stage. We are mostly focusing on the pre-processing step as well as the geometric reconstructions. But anyway, once we um um as we take this this to the next level, definitely we'll consider different types of the of types, including definitely the CTGML as well. Yeah, I I I'm aware of that the CTGML is also very popular and widely used for the kind of the modeling um, approaches. So yeah, thanks for your suggestion. As a sort of follow up, I'm just curious, have you ever evaluated the quality, I mean, kind of a comprehensive evaluation of the quality for the models yeah, sure. that generally? Yeah, of course. Do we have numbers for that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the requirement for different applications, let's put it this way. Yeah. So, um, for example, my parameter modeling approach, I published several papers. I put the paper name here down here. So, if you have more information, I can yeah send you a link to download it. But anyway, so when this paper publication also have the accuracy assessment result. In this example, uh, I remember it has accuracy of geometry accuracy of less than ten centimeter in terms of the RMSC value. And then the more smaller room, this kind of single room approach is more accurate. It's about the kind of the around the five centimeter accuracies. So yeah, that's the kind of geometric accuracy. Um, so this is the room segmentation in terms of precision recall. I think I achieved about more than 90% accuracy, but um, I don't remember, I need to check it again, but anyway, yeah. Back then, I achieved the best accuracy compared to other state with that other result. So yeah, I most of the um, approaches that I introduced here in this presentation, I published I published the relevant paper, so you can get more information if needed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I guess Hans, Hansu was in a microphone and was on all these. I guess he have has some question. I guess Hansu, go yes, ahead. Um, hello, Dr. Jaren John. Thanks for the great Hello. presentation. Yeah, I'm Han Su Song, PhD student working with Dr. Jina Zhang. And my question is, I wonder if you have tried to colorize the scan data for digital twin or beam modeling, because I assume some people might want to have a colorized 3D model. So colorizing point to color data using what which attribute you're talking about? So Maybe you can colorize point to color with the G values and also the segmentation result and classification. So, yeah. Um, so, so how do you, you are, 
I mean, uh, I assume you collected the 3D data from terrestrial laser scanner and mm -hmm. the laser scanner does not have color information, RGB. So I wonder uh, if you have yeah, tried okay, to I put color in it. Actually, the most terrestrial laser system has the capability of capturing RGB values. So wow. yeah, yeah. For example, I, 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 don't, I don't have the example point cloud data here, but yeah, that, yeah um, this is not the terrestrial LiDAR data, but this is the mobile phone LiDAR data, but it has RGB values in it. So oh, and also, yeah, let me see. Yeah, this is another terrestrial LiDAR result in also has the RGB values in it. I'm pretty sure most of the commercial LiDAR system has the capability of capturing RGB values as well, yeah. Oh, I see. Thank you for answering my question. For your question. There is, a, there is a good, uh, because there is a lot of questions, which is uh, everybody excited. But uh, for the sake of time, I get, think we have uh, just time for one more question, if you have any question from the audience. Oh, I yeah, guess so, I have a question. Yeah, please go yes. ahead. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. So my name is Yaraso uh, Koshan. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, working with uh, Professor Ayman Habib. And I was curious um, about your um, the way how you do, you applied, how you converted a point cloud to geometry. I think it was on page 22 of your slides, if I recall correctly. Um, so page 22, I think. 22. Okay. Yes. So as I recall, um, I think it's very um, this example. In general, I think that um, it's a good, very good example of um, how can I say dealing with point cloud data because it's obviously it's very heavy and obviously there are many like ways to deal with this data. We can either tile to allocation or do apply some another um, techniques to reduce yes. the weight and deal with it. But I was curious about this um, geometry. Um, so I was curious about the level of detailization of this uh, geometry. For example, um, obviously we can see the walls and uh, floor, uh, but can we see like some smaller elements here uh, in this point cloud and uh, and model it? So, yeah, I I think I'm not sure if I understood correctly your question, but anyway, the geometric drawing here, um, it's kind of details based on the point cloud input data. So mostly the mobile, um, the, either the mobile scanning system or the terrestrial radar system, they can collect very details of the object in the scene. And once you have those kind of point cloud data with the details, those details can be also can be um, captured by the geometric drones here. So, yeah. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me just uh, repeat my question to make it more clear. Uh, so, Obviously, in different uh, like uh, point clouds, for example, here we have this um, warehouse or some like maybe factory or so we have different elements, right? We have walls, we have like roof, floor, and I'm sure that this geometric like drawing can capture walls and um, floor yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. other big elements. That's for sure. But I was mm -hmm. curious how detailed is this geometric drawing for some smaller elements inside of this facility. And can we uh, use that information to yeah yeah right for, so to create as built model? So again, yeah. So the details of the geometric drawing depends on the point cloud they have. So um, okay. anyway, once you have, I I'm pretty sure this geometric drawing can capture the most. However, the most of the details that you captured from the point cloud there. So. Uh, it's not just the regenerating or kind of the modeling stage. It's just kind of tracing out the point cloud boundary. Yeah, I understand that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can capture the small object as well in that way. Okay. Yeah, thanks for your question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. With that, uh, I think uh, I'm gonna. I would like to thank you know, Dr. Jae Hun Jung one more time for you know the, having a time with us and give us a seminar. I really enjoyed it. And thank you very much. And uh, next week we have a geomedics seminar by NGA group. 
uh, is going to be in-person geomatic seminar next week. I haven't announced it because I haven't received the uh, you know, detailed information from the NGA folks yet, but you will soon uh, get an email about uh, more information about geomatic seminar next week. And thank you very much, Dr. Jung again, and I will see you next time, everyone. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I was really enjoyed my presentation here and talking with you guys. So thanks everyone for thank listening. You. My thanks.